Well, good morning and welcome to Women in Need. We are happy to be back together after our summer break. I don't know about you, but it went by way too fast. But here we are and it is now fall, just like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you either, but fall is the, fall is my favorite color. I just love, 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 love fall. So I'm excited about fall, excited about us being back together. And we've been on this journey this year, the whole year on the fruit of the spirit, diving deep and on each fruit. And um, we had been doing two fruits a month, but alas, it's nine fruits. So God saved the best for last. I didn't even do it, he did it, right? So <clears throat> we've been on this journey and we have finally arrived to the very last fruit, which is, I believe, the most important fruit to possess, and it is self-control. But before we get started, let's do our, our due diligence and let's go before the one who is going to make us able this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you to give you praise and glory and honor. We worship you, the soon coming King. We praise your matchless name. We thank you that we know you and most of, most of all, that you know us and you call us by name and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In this we do rejoice. Lord, we are asking you to be present and not only to be present, but to speak to us. Speak to each one of us, Lord God, for we, your servants, desire to hear from heaven. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So again, I believe that this fruit of the Spirit, self-control, is what is the most important fruit to possess. Self-control aids us in resisting temptation and it helps us to circumvent com uh, conforming to this world's uh, pleasures, its systems, and its ideologies. Having self-control is all important. I don't know if you've noticed, but the whole world seems to be what? Out of control. And it, I don't know if you've noticed, it's getting worse by the millisecond. And so self-control is uh, a very important discipline, which we will hear about today. In other words, in the, in the word of God, we hear self-control mentioned in different ways. Um, there's the word in some translations, instead of self-control, it will say temperance or self-discipline. So these words will be used interchangeably in today's message, but you will know exactly what we're talking about is having self-control. I was looking at, we're going to this morning define self-control and we're gonna look at several definitions of self-control. And we're also going to look at who needs it? What's the benefits and how do we get it? So Dr. David Jeremiah defines self-control uh, self in several ways and I, and I think you will uh, appreciate some of these. He said, choosing to do what is right when you want to do what is wrong. Number two, he said, he gave four that I'm going to mention. It's number two is, it's knowing that you can, but deciding that you won't. You're gonna uh, really appreciate number three, not eating all the popcorn before the movie starts. <laughs> And here's my favorite of the ones that he mentioned. It's the ability to maintain progress toward a goal. With, with, uh, even when you're not in the mood, even when you don't feel like making the effort, even when you momentarily would rather be doing anything else or you find working towards your goal downright unpleasant. With all of this in mind, you still maintain a fixed position in working toward your goal. Doesn't that sound like something else we've heard before? We'll get to it soon. 
Some other definitions regarding this because we're going to look at what the, how the world defines it. Merriam-Webster says this about self-control. Restraint that's exercised over men's own impulses, emotions, or desires. Vocabulary.com says the quality that allows you to stop yourself from doing things that you want to do but might not be in your best interest. Isn't that good? Collins Dictionary says this, the ability to not show your feelings or not to do the things your feelings make you want to do. Some other definitions um, got questioned, uh, one of our favorite sites, is the, says this about self-control and its definition. It's the ability to control oneself. It involves moderations, constraint, and the ability to say no to our baser desires and fleshly lusts. The Greek word or the word temperance in which we were talking about is another word for self-control. The Greek word for this is enkratia, enkratia. And it means strength. And we're not talking about physical strength, but an inward strength that helps us make the best choices. It is having or being self-disciplined or being self-governed having good governance, self-governance, right, Jody? <laughs> Proverbs 14 and 29 says in the ESV translation, it says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Folly comes from the same root word as fool. And it can be translated as foolish or foolishness. And this often happens when we lack control. When we do not, when we cease to have control of ourselves, we normally end up doing and saying foolish things or looking foolish to others. Is that, am I right? And so um, there's some other proverbs which we're gonna look at. Proverbs 25 and 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. When you do not have self-control, you leave yourself wide open. You're like, you're just completely out of, you're, 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 un, you're, you're disassembled. You're no longer whole. You're out of order is, where, is what you are. You're out of order. And Proverbs 16 and 32 says this in the ESV. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. See, it's not the man who has the, this kind of might, this kind of strength, but the one who has the strength of character to control himself. We oftentimes, when we think about self-control, we think about it in terms of who? You, somebody else, not yourselves, but you, you over there, not me. So, but self-control, notice out of all the fruit, this one says self-control. Love, we want to give to someone else, right? Patience, we want to give, we want to be and give to others. But this self-control has to do with me, myself, and I. This has to do with controlling me. Most times we want to control someone else. That's far more interesting. That's far more advantageous as far as we're concerned is to control our fellow man. Tell him or her what to do, how to do, if to do. But for ourselves, sometimes we don't do that as well as we should. Some other um, scriptures regarding self-control that we're going to look at is Titus 1 and 7. Well, Titus 1 and 7 is basically because we want to talk about, well, who can benefit from this? Who is self-control for? It's in, in Titus 1 and 7, it tells us that leaders of the church need to have self-control. If you want to be a bishop or a pastor, 
This man needs to be a man who is not uh, easily angered. He needs to be self-controlled. It gives a long um, list of required characteristics of a person who is leading the church. He or she, he need, cause I bite my tongue, I was about to say she. No, she does not lead the church. He needs to have self and self-control and be self-controlled. But we all need self-control, whether we're leader, leaders or, uh, um, of churches as, as men and, and leaders as women in different areas of life that we lead in, all of us in the body of believers need self-control. Now the whole world needs it, to be honest, but the world is not seeking to please the Lord. You and I are, amen? So we all need self-control because Galatians tells us that we have a war going on in this flesh. And we will revisit that <clears throat> in just a minute. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, he says, I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Why? Lest after I preach to others, I myself might be disqualified. See, oftentimes we, you know, Paul understood. He said, I can preach to all of you. I can teach to all of you about how to keep your flesh in control, about how to control your sexual desires, about how to control your fleshly desires, because this flesh has desires in it that go against God and your, ourselves. And so because of that, we need to be in, the God, in God's word. We need to be, here's the word, abiding in Christ because that is how we are able to do this is to abide in him and staying right where we are. Don't move, guys. Don't, don't, hey, you might not know if it's gonna change. Remember we talked about this abiding and how this is the only way that we are able to even walk in the spirit? So you stay right where you are, but Paul is saying, you know, if I do all of this and then I myself neglect to keep my own flesh in control, I'm going to be disqualified. What good is that? What good is that? If we can tell somebody else what to do, but we ourselves can't do it. Somebody might say, well, you know, I just really have a, a strong uh, uh, affinity for salt. I just can't not have salt. And I'm not saying not have it at all, but I'm talking about a person who overdoes it. Because what we're talking about, about self-control, is, is controlling our passions. Where are some of the areas? What are some of the areas in which self-control is necessary? In our eating, in our drinking, in our talking, in our spending, in our going and coming, right? In, our, in, the, in the desires of this flesh, we need to exercise self-control so that we benefit. And some of the ways that we benefit from being in control, first of all, if just think about it. If we're in control in the areas of eating, think about that benefit, right? No overweight, nobody's overweight, nobody has high blood pressure, Nobody has sugar diabetes, right? Nobody has all of these ailments that plague all of society because of our lack of self-control, right? There's a huge built-in benefit. It's not that God is saying to us, we can't enjoy life, but he's telling us to do it at a moderate <laughs> speed. Do it in moderation. How about sugar? Same thing, right? And um, the same with our emotions. The emotion is something really um, that's really off the chain today. I mean, our emotions get so high that we break fellowship, we break relationships, we lose opportunities. You hear all these people who, you know, are on jobs and all of a sudden they lose it and now they're out of a job and there's a long line of consequences that follow just because of a lack of self-control, just because of refusing to control yourself. So let's take a look at Galatians chapter five. And 
think we're going to start at verse 16. <clears throat> Galatians is where we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And it has a lot to say about this last one. Paul says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So how do we control these desires and passions in our flesh that get us in so much trouble, that cause us to have, uh, a, uh, to be in debt, that cause us to be obese, that cause us to, um, to have all kinds of ailments in our body from just not disciplining ourselves because that's the other thing that self-control is. It's a self-discipline and it's painful. How do I know? I'm going through it myself right now. <laughs> My husband and I are on this, uh, on this journey of marking down, putting down everything we eat in this program on our phone and he watches me while he's on at work. So he can see what I'm eating and what, how many calories and am I going over in this area. It takes, uh, takes count of all my macronutrients, all the nutrients, period. And we kind of see on the thing we're charting is sodium. Along with everything else, we're trying to keep things in balance. And as a result, we've been seeing some good things. Both of us have, you know, trimmed down and feeling a lot better and blood pressures come down and all of these things. But I'm going to tell you, it's not easy. I'm hangry a lot of times. <laughs> it's not easy denying the flesh, but it is beneficial to do it. And so Paul is saying here, I say walk by the spirit so that you don't carry out the desire of the flesh. I'm not doing this thing in the flesh. I have to pray. God, give me strength to turn away from certain things that have been, you know, customary for me to just eat without thinking about it and eat in proportions that I don't, you know, normally consider. Um, instead of having seconds, I just stop at first, <laughs> oftentimes. But look at verse 17, it says, For the flesh sets its desire against, uh, against these, against the, the flesh, I'm sorry, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Why do we need self-control and, and who needs it? All of us, why? Because there's a battle going on on the inside. So don't, this message is not for the other man, the other woman, it's not for someone else. It's not for sister, sister Sue, sister Sally, it's for you and it's for me. This is, right at our doorstep, right at our home, right at our heart from God. We all need it. We all are out of control in some areas in life and we can all do better at walking um, in uh, self-control with the practice of, as Paul says, walking by the Spirit. Now before we became Christians, guess what we did? We walked in the flesh because we were slaves to sin and we were slaves to our flesh, fleshly desires. But now that we are now Christians, we are uh, children of the Most High God, we have a new nature, we're not the same, we're not the old dead man who has to do what his sinful flesh says to do. We're now new and now we take our we, we take our commands from God. We take our commands from God's word. And his Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside is our helper and our keeper. And so for the flesh, it says, sets his desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. This war is going on and until the king comes to take us home. This is an ongoing battle. Ongoing. And these are in opposition, it says, to one another so that you can't do the things that you please. And what he's saying is the things that we want to do, we don't do. The things that we don't want to do is what we end up doing, just like Paul said. It is a plight that all of us who are in the body of Christ contend with. Verse 19 says now, uh, verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, and he lists them all. And the first he talks about are sexual sins, uh, immorality, impurity, sensuality. Then he talks about um, this, uh, the next setup are, uh, are to do with um, worship, 
idolatry and sorcery, you know. Um, and then he says, enmities and strife and jealousy. This is just having fits <laughs> and being out of sorts with people. <laughs> and <clears throat> strife and jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes and dissensions and factions, having divisions in the body. These are the things that Paul, he's not talking about anything new. He's saying, you guys know what sin is. Here it is. You know all about this. This is not what we are called to anymore. Now we're free to live a life in Christ. Now we're free to walk in the spirit and not the flesh. Why? Because we've been made new in Jesus Christ. Why? Because now the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us and he helps us to walk out, to walk by the spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh that are not going anywhere. That's still, that's, that nature is still there. That war is going on to cause us to stumble, to cause us to be led astray, if we choose to do so. And he goes on, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the operative word is practice. So if you are in practice of these things, because let's face it, we all fall short of the glory of God daily in word, thought, or deed. But we're not supposed to be as Christians in practice of any, anything that falls short of God's glory. It's not something we get up and we go, well, it's time for me to sin again right now. Come on. That's not, our, that's not our mindset. Our mindset is to worship and serve the soon coming king. And see, and this is the, so how do we do all of this? <clears throat> how do we do all of this? Thinking futuristic, thinking forward. Because the Bible talks about running a race, running a way, race, so that we can obtain a prize where? In the end. So we're thinking futuristically. I call it taking trips to heaven. Sometimes when tri uh, situations arise that can cause, that maybe I know that in that moment, in the heat of that moment, that I could say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing based on what the other person is saying to me. Somebody can be saying something oh so wrong to me in the, in the wrong kind of attitude and disposition and way, and then, Based on that, I have, a, I have a split second decision to respond in kind or to respond in Christ. And so, and, and really, it's not responding in kind, it's reacting in kind and res or respond in Christ. And so you have kind of a split second decision to make there. And so sometimes what I do is I take what I call immediate trips to heaven. Right away, right there on the spot. I'm like, Lord, you see this person? You hear what they're saying to me? You hear how they're saying it? God, give me your words right now. Help me. I just look at them and say, right now, I start thinking about this person in light of eternity. I start thinking about this person in light of who Christ is, that he died for them, that he loves them, and that, you know, um, I love them despite how they're talking to me. And I'm like, Lord, help me to love them right now in this moment, this instant. Right now, in this moment, this instant the way you do me when I'm out of sorts. He never stops. He never ever stops loving. And love, remember, is not a feeling, it is an action. It shows up, it demonstrates. Christ demonstrated his love for, his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us, right? He who, he, he, he became sin, who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness, the righteousness of God. And so this is, this is the ministry given to us too. We're now to be Christ-like with one another. See, this gives us, this frees us up. Self-control frees us up. Being a Christian frees us up. It frees us up to love one another, to the ministry of, 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 of just extending that love, that grace that Christ extends to us on a daily basis moment to moment, he does it each breath, even before our breath, breathe, inhale and exhale, breath, God's grace. We did nothing to deserve it, but he keeps on blessing us in spite of ourselves, right? 
not because of the righteous deeds that I've done, but because of his mercies. That's why we're saved. And that's how we've been saved, because of his mercies. There is a, <clears throat> there's a poem, and the person who wrote it is anonymous, but I thought it was very fitting. And what it says is, two natures live within my breast. One I love, the other I hate. But the one I feed will dominate. How do we, how are we able to walk in the spirit? How are we able to exercise self-control? We have to feed our spirit on a daily basis in the same way in which when we sit down and we eat at the table to feed these bodies that will, they, this body will talk to you loud if you do not feed it some food. It will it, amen. And, but the spirit being different does it differently. The spirit gets hungry the more you feed it. If we wane or cease to feed the spirit, it will wane in its hunger. How do you become hungry again? Feed it, keep feeding it, and then there'll be more and more hunger for the word. So it works opposite than this flesh, this fleshly body. And then we will find ourselves walking out this word. And sometimes I'm gonna tell you, you could be in this word and still act a fool. Be so it is a decision because we just saw there is a battle going on. There's a battle on the inside and it's going on. It's going to be going on until the soon coming king comes on a daily basis. In some way, we're, we're, we got a battle. There's a struggle and, and a war. But whoever we feed the most is going to be the one who dominates. So oftentimes we f we're finding ourselves losing the battles on small in small ways or great ways. However, losing these battles because we're feeding what? Our flesh more than we're feeding our spirit. And we're not thinking forward. Thinking forward helps us to realize that one day we're going to stand before the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're going to. We, he, we're going to want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We're going to want to hear that. But some of us, the Bible says, are going to suffer loss. And we're going to have regret. We'll make it in. We're not talking about salvation, but losing rewards. And I don't know about you, I like getting A's. I can't see. A's and B's are, all fi are both fine. When I get a C, I tell you, I cry like a baby. My son was like, what's the matter with you? I got a C. He was like, mom, that's great. <laughs> but I really want an A up there. If I worked for A's and stars down here, I really want to, I want a crown there. Amen. And so we've got to get to the place where it's important that we self-govern. We are self-disciplined with our mouths with our eyes, the long night watching the TV, staying up and then, and then it, you know, then we're, we suffer the next day as a result, right? Or reading, staying up all night, you know, moderation, being self-control pays, the dividends are far reaching and you will never find one person to say, darn it, I hate that I lived a self-controlled life. Drat, I've got good health, my bank account's fat, I have no debt. <laughs> All my friends are still my friends. <laughs> You'll never hear that from a person who walks in self-control. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you and give you glory and honor, power, might, and majesty. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to do it. We can't. We can't without you. We know that it takes abiding to remain steadfast, not moving, even when the situation changes, that we do not change is the only way we can walk in the spirit, that we can fulfill any of the nine fruit, Lord God, and self-control um, included, and especially. We ask you to help us to control ourselves, Lord God, in all the areas where we are falling short and each of us have our own stories, have our own journey, and we, you know us. You know exactly where we are. You know exactly what we need. We need you. And we ask you to pour out yourself more and more upon us each that we will grow from glory to glory 
and glorify you, which is what we've been made to do. In Jesus' name.